I am uh, three years older than Prigov, but in in this this set of generations, it's a huge difference somehow. And I never read or heard of Prigov until I emigrated in '79. But once I started coming back to Russia, beginning 1988, I right away was flooded with the fame and importance of Prigov as the voice of the new post-modern, post-communist, whatever, uh, voice, uh, culture, and uh, attended several, I had mutual friends, of course, with him, and I attended lots of concerts, met him personally um, at uh, social gatherings and in person, in kind of visiting friends together in, in, in private um, situations and came to absolutely admire him as one of the, above all, of course, he is a great poet and stuff, but he's one of the the smartest people, the cleverest, the most intellectual, intelligent people I ever met. Uh, I, don't, I don't often agree that somebody is uh, more intelligent than I. He definitely was. <laughs> so I right away admired him. And of course, I started voraciously reading whatever he, attending his, um, his appearances and reading what he wrote and admired it and quoted it and tried to um, understand the, the kind of new mes- message which was new for me. And then uh, very early on after Perestroika, sometime like in 89 or 90, he came over visiting to the States and stayed with us, with me and my then uh, girlfriend. And um, there was right away a very funny episode. To wow him, we put on the table something that he probably had never seen as a denizen of Russia, and it was uh, the fruit of avocado. Mm-hmm. And so he comes to table. Here it is. He comes to table. I prepared this for you. He comes to, to the table and asks Dmitry Alexandrovich. You know, he always insisted on being called by name and patronymic. Dmitry Alexandrovich, do you know what that is? Prigov looks at it and says, "Это um, такое um, генитальное. This uh, something very genital," says he. I said, well, if you choose to put it that way, of course. But what is it? I said, this is the fruit of avocado. And what is that? Says he, what a strange name. And I said, actually, I don't know what, where the name comes from. Let's consult a dictionary. At that point, we're in the end of 1980s or 1990. And at that point, I bought and owned a huge new random house dictionary. Do you see it? Let me... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Let us look up avocado. And I look up avocado and discover it for myself. And it, interestingly, confirms uh, the statement by Prigov. Avocado. Uh, avocado, also called alligator, alligator pear, a large, usually pear-shaped fruit, having green to blackish skin, a single large seed, and soft light green pulp, born by the pro- tropical American tree Persea americana and its variety Persea adrimifolia, often eaten raw, especially in salads. Second, the tree itself. Etymology. Alteration of Spanish abogado, lawyer, see advocate, by confusion with Mexican-Spanish aguacate, sign of etymological origin, from Nahuatl, Ahuacatl, Avocado, Testicle. Now, in addition to the testicle part, you should realize how Aguacate, Nahuatl, and Ahuacatl sounds in Russian. And obviously, uh, Prigov and I perceive that in Russian. How good is your Russian? That's the word for, uh, for the penis in Russian. Nahuacatl, Ahuacatl, Testicle. So, Prigov proved to be absolutely a, uh, at first glance, he exactly, the, uh, exactly saw through, through the thing. Okay, uh, this is a funny, funny story, but of course I met him many times ever since and always enjoyed talking to him, reading him, his poetry, his prose, his, his extremely good at talking to a lay audience, like in a li- in a public library in Moscow, he would talk to the gathered, um, almost 
in terms of postmodern and completely illiterate people, and he would explain what the point of his poetry and messages was, and so on and so forth. And uh, the next story I want to tell you, which is also from our personal interactions, is uh, uh, among other things, uh, on this side, and on this side from my scholarly pursuits and articles, I write short memoiristic vignettes, sometimes very caustic, from my personal and professional life and memories and stuff. And once, when a book was to come out, I decided I'll ask Prigov to provide a blurb. And for this book, the recipient, Prigov provided a blurb, blurb which is sitting right there. I'll recite it to you anyway. I asked him to provide a blurb, and just the next email immediately, apparently it didn't take him long, he wrote this. Now let's see how good you are with this. Какая милая виньетка! Но присмотрись построже. Нетка ли в ней подвоха? Do I need to translate? Let's do it for the for the audience, yeah? Yeah. 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 What a cute little vignette. But take a, a stricter look. Isn't there? Is there? Mm a trap in so he grammatically in inverts the syntax, so it's is a mnt is for the mnt. Нет ка ли. It should be no prismatris ka pastroje net li. But he does no prismatris pastroje net ka li в ней подвоха. Which means that the trap which is in the vignette, as he tells us, also is there in his syntax. And he does it just like uh, like that, playing with the syntax. So he sent, sends me this and I ask, Dmitry Alexandrovich, you put the li as a separate line. Okay. Does it work? No. <laughs> uh, here it is. I can send you the text and you can play with it. Anyway, I said, Li, is, is it going to be a separate line? Which, of course, is strange to have Li as a separate Вам что, строчки жалко? And what is it? Are you begrudging me a line? Вам что, строчки? He is always like that, always present there on every level. In the text, about the text, above the text, metatextually, he's always there in every po in every possible way. Uh, shall I tell one more story? Please. One other story was I was writing an article about something in Russian poetry, actually in Shershenevich, and his interest in Chinese syntax and structures, and I decided that I would use a line out of Prigov as an epigraph for the article to make it more catchy. And the line from Prigov was from one of his, as you know, he not only wrote, he performed, he would sing, you, have, you are aware of those things. And, at, and one of his performances would in, involve um, uh, intoning in a mock Chinese, I think it was not the entire poem, it was the beginning of the poem. Maybe. No, it's the entire, the, the, the one line of a Chinese poem. It was a one-liner Chinese poem, Chinese poem by Pri, and it was intoned. Это китайское. This is Chinese. Это китайское. And I wanted to use this line as a epigraph. I go through all through the internet and through all the books, and I never find the text. I can find the text. It's not. I cannot footnote it with page and <laughs> chapter and verse, right? Uh, so f I don't know what to do, and I go to Moscow to actually give this paper at, an institu at the Institute of Russian Language. And these things only happen with, with, with the great people. I, of course, meet Prigov right there. He's not there to, to listen to me. He's on his own business, but he's right there by the time my, my talk is to begin. And I said, Mikhail Sanch, I have this problem. I'm trying to find this uh, reference to your uh, poem, and I cannot find them. Of course you cannot find it. Because it's not a written poem, it's an oral poem. And it doesn't exist 
in the written mode, it exists in the oral mode. Well, I'm proud to say that everybody else would be, would be, uh, would, would, uh, would, would, would concede defeat there, but I didn't. I said, okay, can you stay for another 10 minutes, and when I start my paper, provide the oral epigram for my <laughs> point. He obviously enjoyed it, relished it, stayed, sat in the audience. I announced that it would be orally produced, and he stood up and in tone chanted it. <laughs> then maybe sat through half of the talk. He wasn't there for the talk and then left. But that's the kind of person he was. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Looked very much like a, an extraterrestrial insect. One of those, uh, the, the, I, I, I always mix up the, the uh, sh sh whom does Schwarzenegger fight? The predator, the I believe one of the those, predator. The predator. He looked like a small size, very intellectual predator, or some kind of other utter, uh, completely inter uh, um, extraterrestrial. Mars, Mars, uh, Mars dweller. He was with his uh, extreme and intellect, with his extreme understanding of everything, and being completely alien to everything and and home and everything at the same time. Yeah, there is one more thing about uh, my wife prompts me. Uh, uh, that there is one thing also to say about Prigov if there is time. Prigov always, always insisted that one poem is not important. I will always quote these favorable, favorite poems, but it's not one poem that matters. He should, every poet should live, should live through a uh, hundred poetic lives and produce a hundred poetic oeuvres, because the point is the, uh, the, the, the conceptualist understanding of what poetry is, rather than just, just, coining lines, which is a boring thing from the past of literature. You know that, yeah? yeah. It's just the systems. And uh, both myself and uh, another poet, mutual friend, Sergei Gandlevsky, who once talked about this, and separately him, himself and me, and, and another case, asked Priyuk, how come you insist that you should write thousands of poems, and you have written apparently 35,000, and somehow at your concerts, at your performances, whenever we meet, you recite uh, uh, 10 out of the 50 that we all know, and not, not the 35,000. And he never came up with a really convincing answer. And I still believe that poetry produces poems, and that out of the 35,000, there are maybe uh, 150 or 200. Great, and then the rest is just some kind of um, refuse, which is inevitably produced, like 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 drafts of any other poet. But there are these one hundred or two hundred uh, masterpieces. I think the influence is there. He added this intellectual, conceptual, meta-textual strain. Uh, to, to Russian poetry, which Russian poetry in general for ages has been non-metaphysical, you know, there are the metaphysicals in the history of English and American poetry, and there were never real metaphysicals in Russian poetry. Brodsky claimed the role for a while with his looking to John Donne and stuff, right? But Prigov clearly added a whole new dimension of Intellect, intellectualism and relativity and meta textuality and so on to the way poetry is practiced today. Not that everybody is writing like that, but he cl clearly uh, heightened the intellectual and self reflexive, etc., metaphysical level of Russian poetry writing. <laughs>